Hey guys, welcome back to Chess Bootcamp. So this is where I'm helping beginners and improving players to get beyond the 1000 uh, rating point mark. And in this video, I'm going to show you, give you a, a short introduction to one of the openings that, that I use in my own games. And it's uh, the Dutch defense. And you play the Dutch. I'm going to show you an example game that I've just played. Uh, you play the Dutch in response to 1d4 by white. So this is a defense that you play as black. And what typifies the Dutch is black's first response uh, pawn to f5. So I think this is a useful opening because it's one of those where uh, white may have his own ideas for, for what he's going to do with uh, after 1d4. Um, but this is a nice way to say I'm going to take control of this opening. I'm not going to just respond with, for example, d5 and let white carry on with his own ideas. So uh, one f5. Now there's a, an issue here. Obviously immediately we have moved the sensitive pawn, which is the, the f pawn, in both, both sides of the board. The f pawn is, uh, or this square, F2 and F7 are quite often targets. So you need to be careful about any possible kind of queen to H5 check uh, kind of move coming in later on. So just bear that in mind. So in this game, um, playing an opponent who's in the 1400 uh, rating point um, area, and for his second move he played E3, so just shoring up the D4 pawn. Another quite common move that you'll see is C4. I think that tends to be probably the most common. Then with ideas of bringing the knight out behind these two pawns to create a nice solid uh, control over the centre. Um, <clears throat> so very often you'll, you'll play e6 as your second move. So that's uh, reinforcing the f5 pawn. And generally the idea is that you want to bring your knight out, you want to bring your bishop out and then castle kingside. Um, and hopefully white will castle kingside, which is likely, seeing as he's got this pawn structure now uh, going that way from f2. So white here plays bishop to d3. I bring my knight out. And white now, in this instance, plays uh, f4, which I thought was a slightly surprising move. It's not one that I see very often playing the Dutch. But ne never mind. So. Rather than just bringing out my dark squared bishop and preparing to castle straight away, I want to grab the opportunity to fianchetto my light squared bishop on b7. And this is a good idea, generally, because if white does castle kingside, that bishop's then going to be on this lovely long diagonal pointing down towards the white king. So, uh, and, and because he's brought his light squared bishop out already, um, he can't really stop my plans now of fianchettoing my bishop here. So the fianchetto is quite a common pattern. Um, it's pretty safe. You can, you can do it on either side of the board. Basically, you bring out the knight's pawn, just one square, and then drop the bishop in behind it where it's going to have control over uh, these nice long diagonals. Okay, so next move, white plays knight to d2. Um, one of the issues with this is, of course, that dark squared bishop is now completely blocked off. And I move my bishop to b7 in readiness for an attack. So obviously with this bishop coming here, there's an immediate threat of um, capturing on g2 and then in the next move winning the rook. So white has to do something about it and he's brought his knight right across now to f3. So I carry on with my basic plan, move my bishop to e7, and in the classical Dutch, a common continuation at some point is to play d6, to create a fairly solid structure around here. Um, it does often weaken e6, so you need to be careful about that. Um, there's also the stonewall Dutch, which is typified by the move d5, so creating this kind of locked off centre of the board. But I've been learning the classical variation, which is d6. Okay, 
White now, because he's moved his knight out of the way, can start to think about developing his dark square bishop, and I go ahead and castle. And this is a very, very common setup for the Dutch. It's one of those nice openings where you very often get to play uh, all the moves that you know um, without too much interference from your opponent. Okay, c3 was played, and then I play d6. So this is the classical Dutch setup. d6 supports um, a potential e5 move later on in the game. White now brings out his other knight there to h3. So, you know, I ask myself at this point, what's his idea with that? Is he wanting to come in with his knight? Not very clear at this point. Um, I also notice that because of this nice pawn structure here, um, I have potentially got an outpost for my knight there on e4, which could be good. So I move my knight straight in there. I figure that his pawns are mainly on the dark squares, right? And that means that his dark square bishop is going to be um, hampered in its choice of moves. It's, it's only actually got one square right now that it can move to, which is the square it came from on c1 in the first place. So I figure that if, if white wants to exchange his good light square bishop, you can see this bishop can move to uh, lots of squares around the board. If he wanted to exchange that, I could come in and recapture with my light square bishop, um, putting my bishop there on that outpost. Um, let's just clarify what an outpost is. An outpost is basically a square up the board where you can install one of your pieces. So not a pawn, but you put a piece on there. And there, because of this square, you can see that these pawns here, the D pawn and the F pawn, have already um, progressed past that square. Okay, so this knight cannot be attacked by a pawn while it's on that square. And that's, that's the important thing, that's the definition of, of, of an outpost. So if white wants to capture or attack this knight, he's going to have to use his pieces to do it, not pawns. Right, so I've moved my knight there. White goes ahead and castles. And clearly I don't want to exchange, I, I'm not going to voluntarily exchange my really, really good, strong attacking knight for white's weak dark square bishop. This is a bad piece. Right now it's only got two squares where it can move on the board, so that is not my idea. Okay, I'm gonna leave that tension there. This is another very common move, moving your queen across from d8 to e8 with the idea of bringing it up to h5 and uh, where it can be part of the attack. And another idea then can be to swing this rook up, or even your other rook, at some point, to lift the rook up to the sixth rank and then across where it can join in the attack on the uh, the white king. So very often your ideas in, in the Dutch are to be attacking on the king's side, on this side of the board. All right. White now brings his knight out to g5. So he maybe he's got ideas of getting rid of this invading knight on e4. So I decide to initiate the exchange, okay? Um, one of the issues with putting my knight on there is that it actually blocked off the route for my Fianchetto light square bishop. So this does help me to a degree. White recaptures with a pawn. So he's now got doubled pawns on the G file. And I decide to bring out my spare knight that's so far undeveloped and it wants to take part in the game. So rook comes up to f4. And again, this was a slightly unusual move and I, I really had to ask myself, what is my opponent's plan at this point? Um, does he want to swing his rook across? Does he want to bring his queen down maybe to uh, attack my king? We shall see. So I bring my queen out to g6. This stops the advance of that uh, g-pawn. And uh, also my queen is now lined up, of course, with the enemy king. White's intentions start to reveal themselves when he swings his rook across to h4. And here I bring my knight in. Now, here you can see the power, the power of this light square bishop 
that's secretly cashed itself over on, on B7, seemingly out of the game. But if you look at the situation now, I, I calculated that uh, white can't capture the knight with that pawn because I have, let's do this properly, I have queen takes g2 and that would be checkmate. Right, there's the only defender of that square is the king himself. Okay, and of course my queen would be protected by the fianchettoed bishop. So, uh, white now has some problems to think about. So he brings his queen across to e1. Um, maybe the queen's planning on coming here to join in the defense. And I advance my knight. So this is my other knight now that I've I exchanged off my first one. This knight is now coming back to that same nice outpost square. Again, I'm, I'm perfectly happy for the bishop to exchange, or and then I might recapture with either my bishop or the, or the pawn. White comes in to attack my queen, and I figure that there's absolutely no reason why I can't just grab the g5 pawn that was protected by the knight, and moving the knight has unprotected that pawn. I, I did realize that there is a, a threat here of knight captures e6, which must be white's idea. So he figures that he can come in here with a fork on my queen and uh, my f8 rook. But if he does that, I know that my queen, now it's backed up by this bishop, I can go in and grab a, a rook also. So this is one of those times in chess where you really need to stop, pause, and calculate. So calculating means, okay, how do I see this exchange working out and is it going to be better or worse for me? Well, let's find out. White comes in with the capture of the pawn. I go ahead and grab the uh, rook. So temporarily, I'm up a rook. Um, I'm expecting white maybe to um, want to exchange queens and this is indeed what happens. So queen takes queen, bishop takes queen, knight takes rook, and rook takes rook. And now I'm up a whole piece, right? Let's just play that through again. So <clears throat> let's go back to my previous move. So I figured that I can take the pawn if the knight comes in I can grab the rook, and if he grabs the rook, I will be able to recapture. So I effectively win a knight out of that exchange. Right? White did not clearly calculate that through the same. So I capture, captures, captures, exchange of queens, takes the rook, and I'm a full piece up now at this point. So we both have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven pawns, um, but I have this extra knight, and it's installed in a lovely position close to the white king. Knights obviously can't zip around the board as quickly as bishops and rooks and queens, so um, generally if you want to be attacking with a knight, it needs to be in the vicinity of your opponent's king. Um, obviously there's an immediate threat as well because my knight is looking at the bishop there on, on d2. So white decides to capture the knight, and I think this is probably an error. Um, he a, Another option for white could have been maybe bishop to e1 and looking to exchange off with my dark squared bishop, because out still, we've still got these pawns on the, on the dark squares, so this bishop is a bad bishop, and this one is a good bishop, and what he's done here is he's swapped off his uh, best bishop, which is the one that's got lots of range, it can travel around the board through these diagonals and between these pawns, and he's leaving on the board his poor bishop, which is currently blocked off and has uh, a lot fewer squares, controls less of the board. Okay, So white goes ahead and captures, and I've now got a choice. I can recapture with my own light square bishop or I can recapture with the pawn. In the end I decide to recapture with the light square bishop. Um, if we've gone the other way and I capture with that pawn, yes it could leave my pawns uh, with a more complete structure, 
but even here I've got the option of playing g6 and getting a nice pawn chain on this side as well and I figure that the bishop if 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 I capture with a pawn then that's going to block off this long diagonal for the bishop and my whole objective in this game is to uh, attack the enemy king and win so I recapture with the bishop I want to keep that uh, that focus and that, that uh, threat against the king. White now plays a, uh, a4. I play a5 to put a stop to any ideas of him forcing that, that pawn through. And white now plays the rook across to f1. I do play g6 to strengthen up this nice pawn chain here. And white starts to uh, pr push his pawns down on the king side. So I move back one tempting white to play h4 which he does so this is all good news for me i'm quite happy here because um i ha i'm remember i'm a piece up i have the bishop pair now at this point and one of the key things to remember um, a lot of strong players are big fans of keeping both bishops on the board and one reason for that is when you think about the end of the game when you think that there are pawns racing to promote um, maybe on both sides, right? When you have one bishop, one bishop can only land on half of the squares on the board. It can only ever um, visit the squares that it started on. So it's either the dark squares or the light squares. When I keep both bishops, when I've got both bishops, between them, those bishops can hit any square on the board. So the, the, the king can be harassed, and I can also maybe prevent a pawn from queening uh, anywhere on the back rank as well. So um, generally a good idea to, to keep both bishops on. So I move my bishop all the way back to this square where it is uh, protected by the rook and where it in turn is protecting the c7 pawn, which is the root of my uh, queenside pawn chain. So I figure, look, I'm ahead in material now. All I need to do is convert this game. I just need to, to hunker down, not make any mistakes, and just see it through to the win. White moves his king. I move my rook across to the E file, which is a semi-open file, where I think it, it may have attacking chances later on. White starts to push his king up. I bring my bishop round back round to here. So what I'm looking at now is I've changed my mind about wanting my bishop on d8. What I want to do now is um, maneuver my bishop round g7 h6 where it's looking then at this pawn. This is this is a backwards pawn. Okay, it's the last pawn uh, in the chain. It can't make its way forwards to here where it can be protected by its cousin on the on the d file. So I figured that if I can bring my bishop round to here and then I might have ideas of maybe moving that bishop to attack the rook. When the rook moves I've then got two pieces. I've got a bishop there and a rook both attacking that pawn on e3. So that's the plan. White uh, temporarily puts uh, a damper on that by bringing his rook up. But I think let's let's maneuver my bishop round anyway. White pushes a pawn, and I bring my bishop round here to attack the rook. Now I'm expecting White now to um, to push g5 and lock off that bit of the board, which he he does. But that's fine for me. Um, all this space around the king now that's emerging is is only going to be good for me in the long run. So I bring my bishop back round away from the pawn, now he pushes b3, and I see that my light square bishop can now jump in and start attacking this little light squared pawn chain, and uh, white really has no way of preventing that, so his response is to push b4, I grab the pawn, he grabs the pawn, I grab the pawn back, and then he pushes c4. Now I, I missed something here, I, I actually missed the fact that his Bishop was now looking at, at a5, um, but there is another loose pawn here, so I went after that. Black grabs the pawn, and instead of grabbing this pawn straight away, because this 
pawn on c7 is also then undefended. I bring my rook across just to defend that. He pushes a pawn forwards, and in doing this, he has now meant that his rook is now defending uh, c4. So I bring in my bishop to his lovely square on e5, and if you look now, this pawn is guarding those two squares, and this bishop is guarding those two squares, so there is no way that the rook can remain on the fourth rank. It has to retreat. So it moves back there. I grab the pawn with an attack on the rook. Rook comes across. And now if my bishop uh, captures this last loose pawn, black, uh, sorry, white's going to have two pieces looking at c7. So I figure I'll go ahead and do it anyway and let the bishop um, grab the, the pawn. Now, if the rook had grabbed the pawn, that would have forced me to decide, did I want to exchange rooks off, which I would have probably been very, very happy to do. Um, in the end, white, I think, made a mistake here and captured with a bishop. And now if you look at the situation, what we've got is that the, the bishop itself is actually pinned. So the bishop can't move anywhere. If the bishop moves, then my rook grabs his rook. But at the same time, this rook is now tied down to the defense of the bishop. So if the rook decides to go sideways anywhere, then again, he's gonna lose material. So what I said to myself is, okay, the only way that he can get out of this would be something like to move the bishop with an attack, like to move the bishop with check. So I figure if my king stays on the light squares, because that's a dark square bishop, then my king can make its way over here, and then I can capture the bishop safely and go on to win the game. So I start moving my king, zigzagging on those light squares to prevent any idea of, um, of white being able to deliver check. He pushes a pawn. I bring my pawn back, sorry, my, my light square bishop back here to e6. So I've got ideas now of pushing the f pawn and that would come with a discovered check on white. Swaps off a couple of pawns. This is making no difference to the game now because um, th this king cannot really advance down the board. It can't go on any of these squares. Now, here is where um, I missed the trick. It's around this point um, because actually rook to h8 is almost checkmate here. But I think this comes in a couple more moves. Okay, so the king advances, and now what, what happens, and I don't understand why this king is advancing up the board, because um, it's got nowhere to go from this point. It, it can't go on any of these squares. So this is where, if I'd have played rook to h8 now, that would have actually been checkmate. But I missed it, because I was too busy thinking about my own plan. And my own plan is to maneuver my king across here, win the material and win the game with ease. So uh, rook comes down, I bring my king in anyway, so now it's, uh, it's attacking the rook. I've got now two pieces attacking the bishop, very uncomfortable situation for white, and at this point white resigns. So uh, that's your introduction to the Dutch defence. Just going over it again very quickly, it's in response to d4, you get the initiative, play f5, e6, Bring your knight, if you can fear and cutter the light square bishop, that's great. Bring your bishop out to e7, and at some point push d6. And then your plan will be to manoeuvre your queen over here. Possibly even your light square bishop can come over this side of the board as well at some point. So uh, it's a pretty solid, uh, enjoyable opening. And if you like attacking, if you, if you like launching attacks against the enemy king, then um, you will get the, the opportunity to do that with the Dutch. So this is something that maybe you might like to try out in your own games. Um, I, I'm tending to have pretty good results with this opening. So there it is. This is the classical Dutch with D5 rather than, sorry, D6 rather than the stone wall, which is D5. And that's, uh, that's an opening that I may try out at some point in time as well. But uh, yeah, give it a crack. Hope you enjoy it. Let me know how you get on. I'll see you next time.